Welcome to the Grazing Grass Podcast, episode 54. We want everything to be fast. And when you're talking about land, when you're talking about the ground, the soil is not that fast. But if you have the patience to continue to do it, to graze at high density, to change your, your cattle as many times as you can or you want, you will see uh, results. You're listening to the Grazing Grass Podcast. Helping grass farmers learn from grass farmers. And every episode features a grass farmer and their operation. I'm your host, Cal Hardich. On today's episode, we have Javier Mesta from Mexico sharing about ranching on his 3,000 acres and the difference that high-density grazing is making for him. We talk about his journey and what he's doing with the high-density grazing as well as carbon credits. Before we talk to Javier, let's do our 10 seconds about my farm. And to be honest, I'm not going to talk about my farm this week. I'm going to talk about what's coming up this week for me. I'm going to the Greg Judy Advanced Grazing School. I'm pretty excited to be going. I've wanted to go for quite a while, but I will fill you in on it next week on the podcast. Um, when you are listening to that, I will probably be close to on my way to going there or will be there. But enough about me. Let's talk to Javier. Javier, we want to welcome you to the Grazing Grass podcast. We're excited you're here today. Thank you, Cal. Thank you so much for uh, giving me the opportunity to share with all your audience. Oh, very good. Very good. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? And your ranch, just get us started. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, I'm from uh, Chihuahua, Mexico. We are in the desert of Mexico. And um, I've got a small ranch. It's basically a 3,000-acre ranch. And when I, for some parts of the world, they said 3,000 acres, huge ranch. But, yes. but for Chihuahua, 3,000 acres is nothing. It's nothing. And you said... Earlier on 3,000 acres, when you first got they said you could run 100 head of cows. Exactly, exactly. Right. Uh, totally, totally. So so it's a small ranch, and I, I bought it because I just love cattle. I love cattle. I love horses. And my dad taught me about this, uh, about this business because ranching is a business. And yes. so he taught me about it. And so when I got the opportunity to get it, I acquire it, and I got it in the desert of the desert because where I got it is hot, 110, 115 degrees in summer. It was a very, very damaged land at that time, but I just wanted to do it, and uh, ever since I got it, I had in mind the mindset of how to regenerate thing and how to make it productive. Because cattle, cattle, just like any other business, it's about productivity and about making it profitable. So that's why I got into the ranch and just loving it. I'm here from Chihuahua, Mexico. I've been here all my life. I had a chance to study in the United States for two years in St. Louis, Missouri. And I'm an engineer by uh, profession. So uh, I love manufacturing and I love ranching, which is what I learned from my dad. Those two businesses. Very good. And you said you studied in St. Louis? I studied in Chaminade College Prep in Crip Course in uh, Missouri. Uh, that was from 15 to 17 years old. And I had a, such a great time. I loved the United States. I wanted to go to college in the U.S., but my dad said, no, you're coming back. So I came, I came back to, <laughs> yes. to Mexico. So you mentioned a little bit, did your dad ranch as well? My dad used to ranch. Yes, uh, he passed away now. And uh, used to have a very, very big ranch. And you see, that's where I started to see how the ranching business started to, uh, to go down. As you see, we, we, we always talk about the weather, how, how the drought come more often than before. And uh, rain is less uh, regular than it used to be with less rain and less regularity. And... So now the ranches have less grass to feed the cattle, less water, so it's going down and down. That That's where I started to see that ever since my dad had the ranch. And then I, I came up with this 
with this idea, I mean, which is not new. I mean, if you go back, it's from the 1960s, 1970s, when this, oh, yes. exactly what they started to work on, on, on this matter. But it's, it, it's something that uh, people just don't believe or people don't want to try it out. But I said, well, what the hell? I mean, if it works, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't work. Yeah, but you try. Exactly, yes. exactly, exactly. Yeah. So when you you purchased the 3,000 acres, you had this in mind. You thought, I'm going to go forth. I'm going to do high-density grazing. I'm going to get this set up and get, go. Exactly. Ever since I saw the ranch, I said, that's what I'm going to do. Because, I mean, you have, you have two options. You have to go either to a big ranch and try to get more cattle in. But you know what? It's just a wisdom. It's, I mean, go and invest that kind of money into land. I mean, I mean, the return on investment should be forever. So I said, no, I'm going to do it otherwise. I'm just going to go to a small ranch. I'm going to try to make it profitable and make my uh, ROI do better and faster. So, so that's exactly what I did. Very good. So you purchased your your ranch, three thousand acres. Tell us what it looked like when you bought it. It was it was a sad story. Actually, on my Instagram and my Facebook, there are some pictures there. Oh, it was it was so damaged. It was so damaged that I actually the land, the ground was kind of like a gray, between gray and black. Oh and, yes. And the reason that happens is because it was an overgrazed and understuck, which it might seem like a something that is not right but actually it is because when you have you don't have enough cattle and the cattle is just selectively grazing then you are overgrazing your land and, and what's because they're overgrazing those areas they love they, they overgraze the areas they love they don't touch what they don't love so what they don't love it just starts to go i mean are you familiar with the licking stuff? That black thing that goes on the on the ground, which actually sta oh, starts yes. to kill life. So that was the way the ranch was. It was it was all all full of licking. The grass that the cattle didn't touch was so old, but in some parts there's actually there actually wood. I mean, you you know that grass. It's at the end it turns into wood if it, if it's very old. So you could see the grass tuft. Uh, in the middle, he was dying. He was like, let's say if it was a cake, but it was not a cake, it was a bun. Okay, so, oh, so yes. the middle, there was nothing because he was full of licking and and the grass was so old, so he was dying. So that's the way the whole, the whole ranch was. And let me tell you something very interesting. I, I got engaged into the carbon credits project. Oh, and yes. And we're in the process of uh, certifying our, our credits. And when they first, because they go five years back, when they first saw with the satellite, my ranch, I mean, it was so damaged that it was releasing carbon uh -huh. to the atmosphere. And after I started grazing with HD, uh, high density grazing, it just started to capture carbon again. So that was the image of the ranch, totally damaged all grass and and not much life and now the story is just a different oh, now yes. i have 90 paddock which are 90 paddocks with electric fence and with poly wire i break it into 1200 paddock so right now we're changing the cattle four times a day and, oh okay and so so it's basically 1,200 paddocks that we move the cattle from one paddock to the other one. So, I mean, just see how how the land, how the ground starts to change once once all the cattle is together and doing the herd effect. Yes. So it's just changing dramatically. I, di I did a study about the basalt cover of the ranch. And yes. it was 10%. 10%. Oh. So, it was funny because I told a friend that I had a ranch that had 10% basal cover. And he said, oh, man, that's terrible. And I said, no, it's great because I've got a lot of, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of uh, space to go up. Yes, that's, that's a great way to look at that. Yes. So I said, if with 10%, I had 100 cattle, 
defense. 500 cards is going to go easy. So now I have oh, 250, does. and I think I'm going for the 500 easily. Yes. Now, when you, you talk about it was two pastors when you got it. Yeah. And you did you immediately go in and put those 90 paddocks in? No, no, no. I, I started little by little. Actually, that's one of the mistakes I made at the beginning. I tried to do it by myself, all by myself. Oh, yes. And I did a, a two barbed wire paddocks, which I sure not do. I just wasted my money. Because as you know, an electric fence, it costs you 10% just in the materials of a barbed wire fence. And, and that's not included the workmanship because doing the barbed wire uh, fence, it just takes a lot more work to do a deal. Oh, yes. I, I did it. I shouldn't have to. And then I started to doing electrical fences little by little. Uh, first, I did them further apart and then I yep. started to split them more and so that's how I got to 90 now. to 90 packs a, a so fixed, what, fixed electrical and now with the bob wire I can go to 1200 so it's fixed electrical is it high tensile wire yes yes how many strands did you put one that's one it. yeah one you don't, you don't need you yeah. don't need more than one that's it that's it once you get the cattle to understand the the system and, and and that if they go closed, they're going to get an electric shock. <laughs> right. They know so. So you just need one. That's it. And th then you're you're subdividing that up further. You're using um, poly braid or twine? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and it's funny because they get so, so used to human that uh, they just follow you. And they know exactly when you're going to open for a new pasture because they know on the other side of the wire, there's a fresh pattern. So, so they're just waiting to see when you're going to open. Yes, they do. And especially with you doing four times a day. Did you, have you done four times a day the whole time? No, actually, at the first I started like once a day or once every two days. That was the beginning. Yes. And then I went up to 12 times a day. But you know what? That was too much. That was too much, and my workers, the cowboys, didn't were able to handle it right. And then that, that's, I mean, the people is just the basic foundation for this system. So if if they don't do it right, they they will not handle the pasture correctly, and your cattle will start to lose body condition. So that's what happened to me. I mean, the ground was doing great, but the cattle cows were starting to lose body condition. I didn't like it, so I said, you know what? Let's go back to four changes a day. Uh, let's go to 125 uh, cattle per acre uh, density. That's good enough. That's good enough to regenerate. I mean, the higher, the better. But you know what? Who pays the bill? The cow. And if the cow is <laughs> yes. a, a good body condition, you will have no calf to pay the bill. So, uh, so no, right. no, 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 no. Let, let's, do, let's do both things, but let's do it correct. And with all those paddocks, how are you getting water everywhere? So, so my ranch, it's a, uh, it's 12 kilometers. How many miles is that? It's like eight miles, like seven miles long. And, uh, so I have a, a water line all the way to the, from, from, from the start all the way to the end of the ranch. And, and that's how I changed the pattern. So I have, so my cattle, my cattle, uh, they walk, at the most 1.5 miles for water. That's the most. Oh, yes. That's the most. Which sounds like a long ways to me because that's that's much further. Of course, I'm not grazing anything that the cows could walk a hundred uh 1.5 miles on. So okay. Okay. smaller area. How how do the cows handle walking that far? It might sound too much, but you have cows that might be walking four or five miles for oh, the water. Oh yes. And you know what? It's, it's not all the time because since I have the water line all, all the way to the ranch and then I have a movable uh, water tank. It, it, well, actually, you move it with a quad, quad bike. So when they start grazing, they start grazing right next to the water tank. And then as they go further into the paddock, on, on the longest, the biggest part of the ranch, the, the more they will walk is 1.5. Five miles. But before we go on into your cattle just a little bit, we've talked about the electric fence, and 
and 3,000 acres, you have a lot of electric fence. Yes. Do you have one energizer running all that, or do you have multiple energizers? I have two energizers, big one and a small one. And the big one is you can set up, and actually you don't have to move it much. It's a big one, and it has a solar panel and a battery. So, so that's the way it works. So the big one, you just set it up in a place. I have it like in the center of the ranch, and then oh, yes. you just do a whole circuit. That's it. It just goes. But I have a smaller one, a spare one, just in case something happened. And for instance, right now where I got the bulls out of the cows, so this one, since I have the bulls further up, further down, so they don't get too close to the cows, uh, I have the small one with the bull, and then the other one for the whole the whole part of the ranch. So with two, it's enough. Very good. And just a little bit about your rain. Um, from past guests on, um, from your area, I know you all have been pretty dry and only getting a few inches of rain a year. Yes. About what have you received in the last year? On the last four years, an average of 10 inches of rain mm -hmm. a year. And that happens on mostly on three months, July, August, September. So that's our rainy season. Sometimes we get something in the beginning of our spring that we sell them. And the situation here in the desert is that if it doesn't rain right, like let's say starting July, August, when, when it's hot and it starts to rain late September, October, then the grass just doesn't grow, just stays short because that's oh. when, the, when the morning starts to get cool. Oh, yes. So you, they just don't grow. So when, when, when it rains correctly, like last year that it rained correctly, at uh, the end of June, beginning of July, August, it was a very good year because that's when the, when the grass grows more. Oh, yes. yes. And what kind of grasses do you have there? The main three grasses that I have is alkali, sacaton, and I got toboso. Those two are hard grasses okay. on, on the teeth of the cow. And then yes. I have I have salt grass, which is better. But those were the those are the main three that I have. When I first started, the the grass was so hard. But what I got to understand is that it gets hard when you don't know how to graze it. Because when you leave it for the cow to selectively graze, then it starts to leave the ones that they don't like. So they start right. to get hotter and hotter every every day. So now now that it's being grazed correctly, they are not that hard. So those are the main three, the alkali, sacaton, the toboso, and the salt grass. But now I have seen and I'm starting to see some parts, new, different types of grass. Oh, yes. You know what? That's exciting to work. That's so exciting when you see them and say, oh, man, I've never seen that before. I've never seen this one before. I've never seen this one before. Because that's when you start to see that the ground starts to regenerate. Because you know, oh, yeah. you, you understand that that centimeters of ground, there's millions and millions of seeds that are there. But there are two things. Even dirt, that they have no life. And also have the ground capping, that even if the little seed wants to go out, it's just impossible for us. So when you start to see that, that's when you see, okay, well, now the ground is starting to regenerate and it's starting to have life. And now look what's happening. It, oh, it's, yes. It's, it's yes. beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And, and you know, you know what, Kyle, it's very funny because uh, I, ju I just love ranching. And, I, and, and you know what? All the cattle ranchers, we must know something about agriculture. Even though we are not going to crop, but we need to understand how our how our ranch can regenerate and grow more grass so we can have more cattle and make more profit. Yes. And, and when you start to understand what happens to the, the dirt converted to soil, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Because you start to see things like first, when you start to see the change in color from white to brownish. And then you start to see herb, and then you start to see flowers. And then uh, yearly grasses, and then the perennials coming. But oh, yes. when you understand what the process is of the regeneration, it's like every time I go to a ranch 
Like I go with my kids, they say, Dad, just let's don't stop fifty times <laughs> before we get to the house. Because I just love it. And I explain them, look I mean I mean you you need to understand what's going on because you're, Oh yes. You're seeing the seed siblings growing. That that means that there's millions going around the whole range. So so things are starting to change. So it's just like you say, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Oh, it is. What kind of cattle did you go with for your ranch? I started with Charbry, then I changed to Angus. And now I have a breed. Maybe you're familiar with the Mashona. Mashona yes. breed is an African uh, cattle. And the reason why I brought that is because it is very, very well adapted to hot climate okay so so my bulls are half angus half mashona and oh, okay and my cattle are i have i don't care i mean i even have rodeo cattle uh, oh, yes. uh, cows and angus and hair force and and charolais and and it, it does beef master i don't care uh as long as they uh, perform well because I go by selection. I, I don't go by type of cow. I go by selection. A cattle that performs well, cattle that gives me a calf every year, stays. If not, it goes as easy as that. Right. Yeah. The important stuff, are they productive for you? Exactly. I mean, I don't fall in love with cows. I, if, they, if they are productive, good. If not, thank you so much. You become it. <laughs> You become a cult cow now. Uh, right, and didn't work for you. So with the Mashonas, are you are you really liking the influence of Mashona on your calves? You know what? I like them very well. You can see their uh, their hair cow. Uh, yes. more more uh, brighter. Uh, they have a more vigor, the animal, and uh, they have more inherent body condition you can see it ever since they're born i mean you can oh, see yeah. the difference so so they are they are behaving very very well the new um cows that are growing that are fr from my bull they're doing very well very very well and you know what i like small cows i like small frame three three and a half at the most frame not oh, bigger yes. than that i believe that a cow it's a cow and smaller the better because the faster he gets uh, they fill up when they're eating and at the end it's going to deliver me one calf i mean maybe a little bit smaller than the other one but so what i really have 1.5 calves and or or two than one so uh, yes. that, that, that's it's kind of cows that i like and they are behaving very well because here where, where i'm at so hot i mean in summer it's just and then you have you have a mixture of a uh, 110 Degrees, 150 degrees, and the dirt is kind of like white. It's white. Oh yes. So I mean, it, just, it reflects so much. So so it gets very very hot. Which is so true. We, you know, we I always go back to Lassiter philosophy of cattle raising. I'm not sure if you're familiar oh, with it, but of course he always said, you know, that cow's got to wean a calf every year, and I don't care why she doesn't, but because if she doesn't, she's not going to be here. And exactly. We've got some family members that raise cattle too, but they, they raise them on a little bit different um, or different philosophy than we are. Okay. And in fact, they had a, a cow calf other day that had lost her calf last year. And they thought, oh, she just looks so good. We'll, we'll give her a second chance. She lost her calf this year. Oh. In our book, they get one shot. And if they mess it up, we're going to send them somewhere else because they're not working for our management. And that's a big thing Lassiter says in his book, which I love his book. I, I read it um, quite often. It's a real quick read, but it's a really good one. And that's one of those important things. Uh, it, it, you're totally right. And you know what? I, I love that book as well. And uh, what you're saying about selection, when he talks about selection, he says, nobody's going to care what color of cow was when it's on the plate. Yes. So, I mean, yes. I mean, he calls about productivity, about selection, and, and, and I think that's the way to go. I mean. Yes. So I'm, I'm kind of interested in the Mashona. 
we do not have very many Mashona cattle in my area. Now, I was looking at a farm or ranch that's not too far from me, and they have started using some Mashona bulls. Okay. So I'm I'm hoping to go visit them at some point so I can see them. I've read a little bit about Mashona, but I've never seen one in person, nor have we used one, obviously. It looks much like an angus, but the angus has like a more like thicker bone. Like, 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 oh, like, yes, like, like thicker. Uh, the other one has a uh, thinner bone and very muscular as well, and very rustic. I think that's the way to say it. I mean, for, for the weather and everything. And, and supposedly, the uh, the cows are more uh, fertile. I'm, I'm happy with them right now, and I'm happy with the cows that I have since inception because I'm selecting. So, the ones that are there. Because they are delivering me a calf every year. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, and you know and what you... I did last year? I brought in, because you see, when I started to see that my ranch had more capacity, I said, okay, so I need to bring more more cows in. So I brought Corriente cows or rodeo. Oh, cows. yes. Yes. Oh, those are great. Let me tell you. Mid-size, they have body condition. I mean, they have very good body condition. And and when they deliver you a cow from a Angus or a Hereford, or in, Mia, or in my case, a half and half with a Mashona, cannot tell their mama it's a rodeo cow. It's amazing. We've had a few guests on our podcast that's really sung the praises of Corrientes. And you know what? I like roping. I'm a header, so I love Korean oh, yes. uh, breed. So, uh, so actually, sometimes I use them, and then after a while, I just take them to a ranch and then bring back. So, oh yes, yeah, but, well, uh, that works out good. It, it works good. It works good. Yeah. But now the main reason to have them, those Korean ones, is to send them to a ranch to uh, for breeding, and they're very good. And they're very good mamas as well. They take care of their cows very well. Oh, it's, it's a good breed. So. When you wean your calves, how are you marketing them? Uh, I export them to the U.S. Basically, okay. I, I sell them. Sometimes I sell them here in Chihuahua. It depends on how the price is. But if the price is better in the uh, the border, which usually is, we export through the Santa Teresa border. Uh, you see, we're right on the border with Texas and New Mexico. Most of the cattle that, that, that is being sold, it goes to the U.S. Some stays here, some goes to the U.S. What I wanted to do now is I want to stir. You see... Talking about Lasseter and uh, about cattle registration, I go more by how productive the cattle is. More if he has papers, more if it's who's the mother, who's the father. I mean, I don't go by that. And so, so what I'm trying to do is, the, like the bulls that I got, they are from a guy that started breeding Mashona like five or six years ago. So his bulls are very, the first ones I got from him. Then I did a uh, in uh, artificial insemination. Oh yes, of my cows with some of the, with some very good Mashona, hundred percent bulls. So now I started to get my own my, my own bulls. So what oh, I wanted yes. to do as well is getting some, getting the market to know my bull, that they are very uh, uh, fertile and and ready to work on hot oh. and dry environments. And you know what? It's very different, Cal. When you go and buy a bull and you go and buy it in a corral when it's feeding with hay, it's beautiful. I mean, it just oh, yes. I mean, it just can help to fall in love with it. But when you take it out of the, the cows, like they said, with a working clothes and see how he oh, behaves, yes. it's totally different. Yes. So I want to sell a good bulls with working clothes, oh, not with a... Now we have tuxedo one with working clothes. <laughs> right. Yes. Javier, before we get to the overgrazing section, and we're going to talk about, a, we're going to take a deeper dive into high density grazing. But before we go there, when you're looking at the future, and I know you've, you've mentioned this a little bit, and we'll talk more about it in the high density, but what are some of your goals for the farm besides your stocking rate? What are some other goals? Uh, carbon credit, for sure. So, 
Actually, let's talk about those carbon credits just a little bit. I'm not familiar with the system you're using there, or I don't believe I am. All right. So it is getting more flows of income of your ranch with the same thing that you do. Mm -hmm. So when you start to work with high density grazing, obviously, like we talked about, you regenerate, so you have more stocking rate, and I want to go 500 cattle, and I will. And But at, at the same token, once you've got more grass on your land and you generate more more photosynthesis, that's when you capture carbon from the atmosphere and bring it into the ground as carbohydrates. Well, have those two things. It brings nutrients to the ground, to the roots. And so, yes. so, so you nurture your ground, but at the same token, you are helping the global warming. Because you see what the thing that, that warms up the atmosphere is the amount of carbon that is on the atmosphere and the plants that we have are not able to capture the photosynthesis to bring it inside. So the more the more the more photosynthesis we can create within our grasslands, the more carbon we capture. And then there's companies that uh, they release a lot of carbon into the atmosphere, so they need to compensate. So if you compensate with your grassland and you capture those carbon credit, those carb those carbon uh, that carbon, then you get carbon credits and they pay you. So that's a an, another flow of income to your ranch oh, just yes. by doing what you are supposed to do, regenerate your land. So we're in the process here in Chihuahua. Uh, there's like 25 ranches that we're working on that right now. And uh, we're in the process of get. we already got certified. And uh, we're in the process oh, okay. of getting, uh, I mean, the money released. Just in the process to get some money. Because see what happens. They have a satellite. It's very, it's very interesting, Kyle. They have a satellite. So you give them your, uh, yeah, your, your coordinates. Your coordinates. And... So they go through the satellite and they said, okay, this coordinates they capture for the last five years this much carbon from the atmosphere. Oh, okay. So that ranch, we can pay them this much per acre because of how much carbon it is capturing. So the more grass oh, okay. you have, the more photosynthesis you create, the more you get. So it's a win. It's so, a win-win. So will they? Yes, it is. I, I, I agree. Is it? So the amount you get paid will... They're looking at it and paying it on the past. So you, so a year from now, they'll look back at the last year, or how do they do it going forward? And they're going to go a year by year. First, they're going to go five years prior, and then they're going to go year yes. by year. That's that's the way it's going to work. Oh, okay. That's the way it's going to work. My ranch at the beginning, it owed. It was so bad that it owed. Yes. And now I have paid everything that I owed, and now I'm in. In good numbers, let's put it that way. So, what I just think about it, Cal, if if the satellite of the carbon has detected that the ranches that we do the high density grazing, we capture more carbon from the from the atmosphere. Just imagine what's doing to your land. I mean, all the carbohydrates oh. that are going into the ground is oh, yes. just nurturing. It's so awesome. That just by doing that, you said, man, my ranch is going to be way better. And you know what? That's, that's something interesting. One day I got a call and they said, Javier, you know, there's a ranch right by, right by your ranch that it's, um, 7,000, it's like 16,000 acres and you can about 400 cattle. It's great. And I said, oh, come on. I'm going to get 500 in, in 3,000. So, oh, so yeah. imagine what the value, what value gives to your land just by saying, if I were to sell my ranch right now, I wouldn't sell it as a 3,000 acre ranch. I would sell it as a 6,000 acre because it has the capacity to carry way more. A, oh, yes. I mean, it's cash flow. It's yeah. cash flow. It's, it's a business. Oh, yes. Yeah, it is. Yes. Well, Javier, it is time for us to transition to the overgrazing section. As we mentioned a while ago, for the overgrazing section, we're going to talk about high-density grazing. And 
You mentioned earlier you were grazing 125 cattle per acre. Right. That's correct. And, and the way how you measure that, uh, uh, Cal, is let's say if you had 100 cows in one acre, it's, the density is 100 to 1. So, and the higher you go, the more you regenerate your ground. It's, it's very simple. It's very simple. The closer you have your cattle, two things happen. They are not able to graze selectively. Just imagine if we go to a buffet and it's just you and me and there's tons of stuff, we will select what we eat. But if there's 100 yes. more people going, we'll take whatever we can. <laughs> Nothing will get rotten. Because if we select, then what we don't select is going to start to go old, it's going to rotten, and it's going to go bad. So that's exactly what happens. Cattle comes in uh, on a non-selective way at high density. So they, as they walk, they eat. They never stop. You can see them how they walk. They eat. They go back and forth. And then two more things happen. Uh, the hoof, they are breaking the capping of the ground. So it's just better for the land. Uh, the saliva helps for the vigor of the plant. The urine, it helps for the it's nutrients for the ground. And the dung, which is so amazing, the dung. It's just <laughs> yes. food for the ground. So this cow is a, an amazing regenerating machine. So when we do this type of grazing, they just... They are close to each other. They are making all the disturption on the ground. They break the capping. So what happens then? And then they nurture with all the things that we talked about. So when water from the when the rainfall comes in, it doesn't it doesn't run as fast because now the capping is broken, so it starts to go in. Oh, so you can absorb it. And, yeah. and and you know, we we can go to something else. Uh, like I never use ivermectine for my cows because it will kill the beetle, it will kill the termite, it will kill the ant. All those guys that go in there and work with the dung, with the manure, get it into the ground. I think it's, and I think they said it's the strongest animal in the world because the way they roll the dung, the dung ball. And um, yes, so the dung makes a sponge effect. How many holes do you get when you have enough? So when water goes through, it goes into the hole. And then what the beetle doesn't need, then the termite comes and gets it. Or the almost of the termite is fertilizer as well for the ground. So when you let the nature work by itself and help them up, it is amazing. It is amazing what happens. And also, one kilogram or 2.2 pounds of dung have the capability to capture 20 liters of rain water. So imagine what you do to your land when you get all that dung spread all over. Oh, yeah. I mean, so it's, it's, like, it's like they said, it's not how much it rains, it's how much you capture from the rain. Right, yes. So, so it's important that it rains enough, but it's, also very important that whatever comes down to your to your ranch, to your grassland, you capture the most you can. So you get more moisture and the cycle, the whole cycle just goes on and on and on. Now you mentioned a while ago one hundred and twenty five cattle to the acre. Is that what your target is? Or is that fluctuating some? You know what? I'm gonna stay there for a while because as I mentioned, okay. I went to almost three hundred uh, cattle per per acre, and that was too much. That was twelve changes a day. You see what happens is this system. You need to be very careful that your cow, the rumen of your cow, always has to be full. You're gonna starve, not one minute. So, if you don't make the changes on time, then your cow starts to get you starve them. And yes. if your cow is not full the whole day, then body condition starts to go down. And if body condition goes down, then you will not have a calf at the end of the year. So that's very important. So that's why I said, okay, what is a, the good starting point is 40, 40 cattle per acre to start regenerating. And from then up, it's, it's awesome. 
So I'm I'm starting I, I'm staying at 125, 125 uh, per acre. Very good, Javier. Uh, excellent description and explaining that. And we are going to transition to our famous four questions. Okay. Same four questions we ask of all of our guests. All right. Our very first question. What is your favorite grazing grass related book or resource? There's a book. I don't know if you're familiar with Johan Sisman. And he wrote a book that is called Man, Cattle, and Bell. Oh, that yes. Is, okay. So that... That's a book that I have in Spanish and English, and it's audiobook and physical book. It's, it's amazing. I just love it. I read it and read it and read it. I purchased that book not too long ago, but um, as fans of the podcast will know, I, my to-read list is quite long, but it's on my stack to read. I just haven't got there yet. has a lot of knowledge and in a very simple way. I, I like things simple because when, you know, when things get too hard, then you don't do it or you don't understand it. And that's yeah. what happened when, when I brought people to the ranch, Cal, when they say, is that how you do it? Yeah, that's it. Oh, it's yeah. easier than I thought. It is. But there's a lot of people think so hard and it's not. It's just about a discipline of doing it every day and continuously doing it and never, never quit. Just keep doing it because it pays, and it pays off very well. Oh, yes. Very good. Our second question, what is your favorite tool on the ranch, or what tool could you not live without? Oh, the electric fence. Without the electric fence, there's no way that I couldn't have 90 paddocks by now and break him to 1,200 paddocks. So oh, I, yes. think, I, I think that's the, main, that's the main tool. It's funny because horses... I think horses, we use them like 5% of the time. We usually go walking. We go with a quad bike. That's it. Horses, is very seldom that we use. Just what you gather, when we have to change them, like if we're going to work them, like this Saturday, oh, yes. we're going to work, we're going to work them. And so we need to change them from one pasture that we're far from the corral, change them to a corral. That's when you use horses. But beyond that, we never use them. Oh, yeah. Our third question is, what advice would you give to someone just getting started? Patience. Patience. That's, patience. Patience is a good one, yes. Because we are you you know, on this on this time of uh, of our era that we're living, we don't have any more patience. We want everything to be fast, we want everything to be immediately. And when you're talking about land, when you're talking about the ground, the soil, is is not that fast. But if you have the patience to continue to do it, to graze at high density, to change your, your cattle as many times as you can or you want, you will see uh, results. And they told me once, they said, that they, uh, my advisor at the ranch, he said, okay, Javier, let's, let's put it this way. Let's say that you want to you wanna cook a meal. And you have all your ingredients all chopped up and everything you put in your pan, put the oil on, but you don't have any gas in your stove. So the gas in your stove is like the rain. You might be working on your pasture, on your paddocks, and then there was a very seldom rain and you see some changes, but not as much. So you might say, oh man, this thing doesn't work. Forget it. Let's go to over, let's go to selective grazing again. This just thing doesn't pay off. Yeah. No. It will pay off. You just need one good rain and you will see the difference. It's amazing. So patience, 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 because it works and it pays off. Very good. And I'm not sure we've had patience suggested before, but I I fully support it. I mean, it takes time and you got to have patience to, to follow through and to get to start seeing some of those results. And maybe that's something I need to work on because I need to diet, but I don't see any results yet, so I'm not being patient enough. But that's another topic. <laughs> Javier, where can others find out more about you? Well, I have um, on social media, I have Don Tachin Grazing. Don Tachin, it goes under my father because they used to call him Don Tachin. And oh, yes. so that's, that's the name that I, that I uh, put to the, to the ranch. So it's Don Tachin Grazing. 
I mean Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and uh, LinkedIn. So there no, you can see, good. you can see a lot of pictures, how the ranch was, how things are moving along. Actually, there's people that ask me questions there. So I, get, I answer so we can have communication through there. Very good. And we'll put links to your media accounts and your website on our show notes. Okay. And Javier, we thank you for coming on and sharing with us today. Well, Cal, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to share this information with uh, with your audience because you know what? I love cattle. I love cattle ranching. And I just love when cattle ranchers do good. And the real good, the yes. bad things right now is that we're not doing good because there's more, there's less rainfall, less grass on the ranches. So, so ranchers, we are really struggling. So we're part of them. And now that I'm seeing it work in my ranch, I want to share it because it works. And we got to become profitable again on the ranch. Exactly. Yes. You're listening to the Grazing Grass Podcast, helping grass farmers learn from grass farmers, and every episode features a grass farmer and their operation. I've enjoyed today's conversation and hope you've enjoyed it as well. If you would like to continue on the conversation, visit the Grazing Grass community at community.grazinggrass.com or go to the grazinggrass.com and click on the community link. You can find the Grazing Grass podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So if you haven't subscribed to us on YouTube, we encourage you to go over and subscribe. We will be releasing episodes over there. We also have a lot of episodes we haven't released that we're going to get over there as well. And if you find something valuable, please share it. We appreciate you sharing about our podcast and getting the word out. Are you a grass farmer? Would you be interested in sharing about your journey? If so, go to grazinggrass.com and click on Be Our Guest. There's a short form you fill out, and we'll be in touch. Until next time, keep on grazing grass.